So in this lesson, we look at uh, the feeding design, and we'll apply what we learned yesterday from casting solidification to how to design good feeders. What we want to aim is perfect feeders. So particularly, first we look at why do we need feeders. We will look at what are different types of feeders and connections of the feeders to the casting. We will look at uh, different shapes and which shape is more effective and for what reason. And finally, we will look at some measures of feeding uh, design, like feeding capacity, feeding efficiency, and of course, yield. All, all of you know that. But capacity and efficiency are a couple of new things which we will introduce in this. Okay. So, start with let us be very clear where we need the feeder. The contraction which we talked about earlier has three parts. The first part is liquid contraction, which is from pouring temperature to liquidest temperature, which is compensated by pouring excess metal in the gating system. Second part is your from liquidest to solidus, where we need to apply feeders. And the third part, which is completely solid contraction, is taken care by those mold elements which we discussed in the last lesson. So we talk about now the second part of, so, uh, of volumetric contraction, which is between liquidus and solidus. And we said it is quite significant. This could account for almost half of the total volumetric contraction of a casting. Okay. So feeding is what we look at. Now what is the basic definition of a feeder? A feeder is one which supplies liquid metal to the hot spot in a casting. So hot spot itself, which is feeding the remaining part of the casting, gets liquid metal when that is solidifying. And therefore the defect shifts instead of hot spot to the feeder. And feeder is cut off and recycled in the furnace. That is the basic principle of feeder. And remember, any feeder which does not do this job, you should question that. And I can tell you several examples of feeders which, if we are not there, life is better than if feeders were there. What I mean is, a badly designed feeder is worse than no feeder. Or other way of putting it, no feeder is better than a bad feeder. <laughs> so we will see what is the example of bad feeders. So the idea of feeder is that end of the day, the shrinkage defect should not happen in the casting. It should shift completely to the, to the feeder. Now people say feeder and riser in different place. And most literature, they will interchange the word feeder and riser. They have mean the same thing. In this course also, we may for the sake of practicality, we will say sometimes feeder, sometimes risers. But in my own mind, I have a small distinction between the two. Okay. All risers are feeders, but all feeders are not risers. Usually, I mean the word riser to something which is open to the atmosphere, where I can see the rise of the metal in the mold cavity also. Whereas feeder is something which, which is, whose job is only to feed the casting. It may be blind, in which case I cannot see the rise of the metal. Okay. We used the word yesterday that finally we want to achieve controlled progressive directional certification. Okay. What I mean by that is that my casting part as well as the riser, the combination of both part design and the riser design or feeder design should be such that okay, thin sections are fed by thicker sections, which are fed by thicker sections, and those are in turn fed by feeders. That is a controlled progressive direct certification for me. This is what I want to achieve, and you see that it is not easy to achieve in all cases. The idea is the green arrows show me the feed path from the feeder to the thick section to thinner sections in the cavity. Okay, so you have several different types of uh, feeders. Okay. You can classify, again we are good at classification. So we classify them in terms of where they are located on a casting. Is the connection to the feeder to casting is, you know, we say top means the feeder is above the casting and we say side feeder means feeder is to the side of the casting. So connection between feeder and casting is defined as top and side. Then the shape which will come to in a second, but before that the feeder top itself, is it open or blind? And you saw, you saw that the heat transfer is different depending on your whether you say sand casting and steel or die casting aluminum. The radiation heat transfer is different from both the cases. Then we have basic dimension of the feeder. Diameter height could be only two, but there could be many more dimensions if you have a complicated feeder. In terms of shape, if you see, we have a large variety available. We can talk about basic standard cylindrical shape and that itself can be either straight shape or conical or tapered shape and taper itself can be what is called a straight taper and reverse taper. Then you can have spherical and oval and, and some other shapes like cruciform also is possible to have as a feeder. This example gives you the two um, different types of feeders in two into two times. 
the top feeder which you see is a is a top open feeder. It's a feeder on the top of the casting and it's also open to the atmosphere. The other examples which you see are, are basically side feeders and they are blind feeders. Also you see that the top feeder is big, side feeders are small because they correspond to the hotspot in a casting. A larger hotspot requires a bigger feeder, smaller hotspots may require a small feeder or sometimes you can take care of it by different methods. Now why between top and side, what are the plus and minus, advantages and limitations? Now top feeder, one big advantage is that it supplies additional pressure because it is on the top, so you have additional pressure of the metal which can feed better, which means you can have a slightly smaller top feeder taking care of the hotspot requirement. But if you are having a connection to the feeder and casting as a neck, and neck is usually smaller than the feeder, you have an undercut around the neck, which means you have to put an additional core. Otherwise, you cannot make the neck. Otherwise, you have a straight feeder which is difficult to fiddle. Now, if you have a side feeder, the big advantage is that you can put a side feeder typically at the parting line, if it is a middle horizontal parting line. And once you put a side feeder parting line, you can usually put a gate also to the feeder. And putting gate to the feeder has two advantages. One is gate brings in hot metal and feeder is hot and you want feeder to be as hot as possible for a given sh shape and volume. Second thing is when you fettle the feeder, the gate also gets fettled. So you have only one fettling mark instead of two fettling marks. So you have double advantage of putting side feeder. So between top and side, most people try and prefer side feeders. If you have, both are almost same, same, same both are possible. Okay. But remember top has an additional advantage of pressure feeding. So if you have a critical location, you cannot put a big feeder, you want to put a small feeder and the top of the feeder has to be fed properly, you have no choice but to put a top feeder and put a undercut and have a core if necessary at that point of time. Now what is the ideal shape of a feeder? You remember we talked about that Chorino's equation, where you say solidification time of a body is proportional to the square of the modulus, where modulus is you know, the ratio of volume by cooling surface area. So what is the ideal shape? Sphere, because sphere has the smallest volume smallest surface area for a given volume, which means it has the highest modulus for a given volume. So ideal shape of the feeder should be sphere, okay, should be sphere, ideally sphere. What we will find is, <coughs> we cannot have a sphere for simple reason that as you see little later, there is a pipe formed in the feeder and you will see how pipe is formed and that pipe can extend into the casting, that is one reason. But before that there is another reason that if you are putting a top feeder especially, the whole bottom of the feeder becomes an undercut and you need a very complicated core to take care of that, which is not economical in a manufacturing. So usually spherical feeders are out, okay, usually they are out. Now so what they actually use in practice are all these varieties of shapes. You can have cylindrical shapes, you can have uh, what is called as a oval or rectangular with generous fillets, okay, elliptical, oval, rectangular with fillets. You can have a spherical top, you can have a, or you can have hollow shape. Sometimes you have a core in the middle, a hole in the middle. You sometimes you need, there are no choice but to put a hollow feeder. I remember hollow feeder is not a good idea because you are increasing the heat, heat transfer area. So feeder effectiveness is not very good. Okay. Or you can have a cruciform shape which has some advantage of its own. Because the sharp corners on the sides actually are hot and as you will see later, cruciform shape can give you slightly higher yield if you design it carefully. Now on the side feeders, you have again some more combinations. You can have the same oval and uh, cylindrical shapes, but now you can also have a spherical top. These are all blind feeders. The spherical top is a blind feeder. You can't have a spherical top open feeder, obviously. Okay. Or you can have spherical bottom feeder. So all these spherical top, spherical bottom are coming closer to the sphere, but they are tall. And that takes care of the piping problem, which we will see later. So what is this pipe I am talking about? The first picture here actually shows you how a feeder, inside a feeder looks like. When you cut a cross section, there is a hollow of that shape in a short freezing range alloy like steels. Okay. Why does it form like that? If you see the bottom picture, first what happens is, you have uh, the yellow area is a liquid metal let us say. And the liquid metal is initially when the feeder starts solidifying, okay, feeder starts solidifying, 
is solidified from the side. Feeder starts solidifying, casting also is solidifying and some of the metal feeder is supplied to the caster. So the level in the feeder falls down a little bit. The yellow area which is liquid metal falls down. After some time, some more of the feeder is solidifying from the side, some more liquid falls in the middle and so you see the shape, the typical pipe shape which you see in, in, in industry. So the pipe shape which is the hollow of the, of the feeder is actually volume of metal which is supplied from the feeder to the caster. So when you say feeder volume, do not think the entire feeder volume is available for feeding the casting, it is only the volume of this conical pipe kind of a region which can supply. Okay. How much is that? Typically it is about 15 percent. Okay. Now that is for short, uh, a short freezing range. If you have long freezing range alloy, you may have not a pronounced pipe like what you have seen. It may have a little bit of a dip and under the dip, but you might get some central line porosity. Similar to what we discussed earlier, temperatures are not so different and gradients are little shallow. So you may get a little distributed porosity, not a cavity or a pipe in a long freezing range alloys. Now let us look at actually how much I really need for feeding. If it is aluminum and we are now comparing only liquid density and soil density, not pouring density. I am only comparing the density of the metal at liquid state and soil state and that is the difference that I need to supply by excess uh, volumetric contraction from feeders. How much is that? In aluminum it is 7 percent, copper 5 percent. If you look at cast iron and steel, cast iron is really low because you know it in between it expands also partly because uh, it can come down to as, as low as 1.52 percent, low, low grade cast irons. Steels can be as high as 5 percent. Of course, these are generic values for a whole steel. Steel is family of alloys. But in general, you can see it ranges anywhere from let us say 2 percent for low grade gray, gray irons to as high as 5, 6, 7 percent for some steels and aluminum alloys. That is a lot of requirement there. So now we define something called as feeding capacity. And this is an important concept. We need, we need to understand this because it defines our or determines our feeder design. What it means is the volume of liquid metal actually available for feeding in a feeder divided by feeder volume. And do not think that feeder, if feeder volume is 100 cc, I have 100 cc of feed metal. No, it is not that. The capacity of feeder is only it will be 15 percent of that in case of a normal feeder, uninsulated feeder. Okay. It is actually 14.7 to be precise, but 15 percent is fine. Um, for our I want, I like to be approximately right instead of being accurately wrong. You know, with calculators you can get very accurate numbers which are wrong. So we, we look at about 15 percent capacity. So which means that if I want to feed, my feed metal volume requirement is 15 cc, I cannot put a 15 cc feeder, I need to put a 100 cc feeder. Remember that always. Now I can increase the capacity of the feeder by insulating that. It can go up to as much as 25 to 40 percent with insulation. And I have one more trick up my sleeve, I can sprinkle some exothermic powder or put exothermic cover on top of feeder which generates heat and therefore keeps the feeder even more hot for longer duration. So I can have as much as 50, 60 even more than that available from feeding. I am increasing feeding capacity of a feeder by doing these tricks. Okay. Now what is efficiency? So if my, my feeding requirement is 30 cc and my feeding volume is 100 cc, my feeding efficiency is 30 percent. Okay. I can link it to capacity, but we keep it separate for the moment because feeding efficiency is defined like this in industry. Ideally, we should keep it as volume used for feeding by capacity of the feeder, but we will, we will not, I do not want to confuse people too much. Now how do you actually improve this efficiency? One way to think about improving is to connect the same feeder to multiple castings. So volume used from the feeder is more because each casting is taking that much volume and volume of feeder remains the same. So maybe I can think about doing that. Okay. There are some problems in that we will see a little later. But end of the day, my feeding uh, volume from the feeder cannot be more than the theoretical efficiency of the feeder. So efficiency is 15 percent, I cannot exceed that. Oh, sorry, capacity is 15 percent, I cannot exceed that. So in one line, your feeding efficiency cannot be more than your feeding capacity. If feeding capacity is 15 percent, 
remember your maximum feeding efficiency can be 15 percent only. If feeding capacity is 40 percent because you applied insulating sleep, the maximum efficiency can be 40 percent. So, if by chance you calculate and find, find your feeding, feeding efficiency is 50 percent and you put only insulating sleeve, then there is a danger there, there is a problem there. So, you have to always check your efficiency and efficiency must be less than the capacity. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No, no. Don't worry. I'm. I'm going to give one example at the end again, which exactly answers your question. Okay. So what we talked about was capacity is what a feeder can actually supply. Efficiency is what is actually supplied to particular casting, and what is actually supplied cannot be more than what its theoretical efficiency is. Okay. So yield is. Uh, we are talking about feeding yield or feeding contribution to yield. The actual volume of the cast part divided by the volume of cast part with the feeders. We are not looking at gating here because we are looking at feeding contribution to yield. Later on we look at gating contribution to yield and finally look at total yield. So, we will have three yield values overall yield finally. So, this is nothing but your part volume or if you want part weight divided by casting weight which is part plus feeders here. Okay. That is my yield here. And again, we're saying that you can improve the yield by connecting the feeder to multiple castings, typically. Or you can apply those feed aids. You can reduce the feeder size by applying a insulating sleeve or a exothermic cover to that. Okay. Let's talk about again how do I get perfect feeding? And let's pay attention to this slide because I put down five principles of getting my feeding perfect. Rule number one is, or rule number one, two, three in that order is: first is I should take care that there should be no isolated hot spots in the casting. Any hot spot should be shifted to the feeder. So, first rule is no hot spots in the feeder. Rule number two is I must have good feed paths. There should be no feed paths converging and merging and stopping inside the part. They should all whatever happen should converge and merge and stop in the feeders, which means feeder is feeding the casting. If the feeder feed paths stop in the casting, which means casting is feeding itself or a hot spot in the casting is feeding itself. We do not want that. And the last thing if you remember the three rules for getting shrinkage, we are now doing reverse of that. We want a slow cooling rate, so that feeding can take place all over comfortably. <coughs> Rapid cooling does not promote good feeding. Rapid cooling can give you better microstructure and properties, but may not give you good feeding characteristics. That is from quality point of view. But remember perfection always means quality at low cost. So, I also need to make sure that my feeding efficiency remains high. I also want to make sure my yield remains high and I am going to mix up now these two, how these relate each other, efficiency and yield with each other. But first of all, let us go get those four, five points right and the holy points. I am going to now in the next lesson talk about these five points and how do we achieve those by different ways of doing feeder design. But let us first get that these are our five goals of a perfect feeding. Okay. So, now let me summarize first. So, why we need feeders to compensate volumetric contraction between liquidus and solidus in a casting. And we looked at various types of feeders, your blind and open feeders, you may have top feeder, side feeder or with different kinds of uh, insulation or exothermic covers. Okay. The shapes can be a variety of shapes, we looked at that. Okay. But anything which is closer to a spherical shape like spherical top, spherical bottom is little more efficient for the same volume, but except you have to worry about pipe may form and then you have to make sure the pipe does not enter the casting. Pipe should be contained within the feeder. And then we introduce the concepts of feeding capacity, feeding efficiency and yield. And finally, we said perfect feeding is one where you have controlled temperatures, gradients and cooling rates to minimize or prevent your shrinkage defects. Okay. 